We're happy to have Enrico Hermann telling us about collider physics tools for dissipative effects in binary dynamics. Well, let me also start like the rest of the speakers for thanking the organizers for putting together this extremely nice and interesting workshop. And I really learned a lot over the last couple of weeks and I, I really enjoyed the discussions during many of the talks. And with that in mind, it's like more supposed to be like an informal talk. So if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to stop me and ask your questions at any time. Um, so this, what I'm going to talk about this collider physics tools for binary dynamics is based on a couple of papers that we wrote in the last few months together with Julio Para Martinez, uh, Michael Ruf and Mao Seng. And I'm only giving the first part of the talk and after like 25 minutes or so, uh, Michael is gonna take over and, and finish up. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the Kossauer maybe O'Connell formalism, the KMOC formalism that we heard a lot about in the recent weeks. Uh, to extract uh, classical gravitational observables from scattering amplitudes. So yeah, so the basic idea of this formalism is to derive these classical gravitational observables from, uh, from quantum scattering amplitudes. And uh, the idea here is that we can exploit all the nice features and all the, all the kind of recent progress that has been made in the field of on-shell scattering amplitudes. And we can make use of like very mature tools that have been used in collider physics uh, computations for the last uh, several decades. So today I'm going to discuss mostly uh, the two-body dynamics for hyperbolic orbits, but as Rafael Porto and others have shown, is you can also take some of these observables to analytically continue them to make use, for, use of them in the bound, bound problem. So today we are going to focus on two key observables, and one is the gravitation, what's called the gravitational impulse, which is related to the scattering angle chi, and another thing is the radiated momentum, uh, which is uh, related to the radiated, ener the radiated energy in the, in the binary encounter. So one thing I want you to like get to take away from the get-go is that like once I write these KMOC observables later in this talk, you should keep in mind that there's they're looking somewhat like cross-section calculations, uh, cross-sections in collider physics settings. And today I'm going to focus on simple, what I call inclusive observables and the advantage there is that they depend on very few kinematic scales. In the previous talk, we've seen the, the waveform that I would call an exclusive uh, observable because it, it depends on all the angles, the retarded time, and so on and so forth. So here we discuss the gravitational impulse and the radiant momentum, which as it turns out, depends only on a very few scales. All right. So with this in mind, I don't really have to motivate why we're studying this. I think in the context of this workshop, everyone is very interested in uh, binary dynamics of black holes and compared like in, in relation to LIGO and like future gravitational wave uh, observatories. So what I want to do here is like, I want to give a brief review of the KMOC formalism, even though we've already heard several talks like at the beginning of this week and also David Kossauer's talk uh, during, the, during the conference. And uh, yeah, use this KMOC formalism uh, and show its relation to scattering amplitudes. And in particular, I, as I already said, I want to focus on these two key observables, the gravitational impulse and the radiative momentum. Um, then I also uh, say a little bit very briefly about like what goes into the construction of these uh, building blocks, namely what are the integrants and how we use collider physics tools, namely in the form of generalized unitarity uh, to uh, have efficient tools to construct these integrants. So that will conclude my part of the talk and then Michael is gonna take over in the second part to tell you of how to compute some of these uh, on-shell phase-based integrals or these uh, cross-section type these cross-section type objects with a method also from collider physics that goes under the name of reverse unitarity. And he will also show that um, there's some way of like simplifying your life to do these calculations that come from the like, certain cutting rules that allow you to do phase-based integrals uh, in a simplified setting. And then at the end, Michael is gonna assemble all the observables and discuss a little bit on the results. So one uh, caveat here is like today I'm going to focus on the spinless on the scattering of spinless black holes, but uh, 
in principle, one can take spinning effects and tidal deformations into account as well. And that's like probably something for future work for us. So let me just start by uh, giving you a very brief review of uh, the KMOC formalism and its relations to scattering amplitude. So what are we interested in? We are interested in the scattering of uh, two black holes that are massive particles, like mass M1, M2, and they have some momentum P1, P2. And these particles scatter from an in-state and some out-state. And uh, uh, the crucial part here is that there is a separation of scales, namely that these uh, two massive black holes are separated by some asymptotic impact parameter B mu. And I'm defining my impact parameter B mu at asymptotic infinity. And it's crucial to keep in mind that there's uh, like two impact parameters that uh, often play a role. One is this asymptotic impact parameter B mu that we're using. And then another one is the one in the iconal formalism, which is just rotated by a cosine of the angle over two. So we are mostly working in this B mu in this asymptotic impact parameter space. So as I said, this uh, KMOC uh, formalism has already been uh, talked about uh, in the context of this workshop, namely by David Kossauer in the conference and by on Monday by Ricardo Gonzo. So how does KMOC treat the scattering event? So a priori, it starts from some quantum picture. And in this quantum picture, we treat these uh, massive black holes as like wave packets that are separated by some impact around our BMU. And then the presence of these gravitational interactions has two key effects on the scattering event. So one is that due to the presence of these gravitational interactions between these two bodies, there is a momentum shift on these individual bodies, which we call the impulse, which is like a momentum shift on each particle, pi. And that thing is related to the scattering angle in a conservative case by this, by this equation here. And the second thing is due to the gravitational interactions, the bodies deflect and thereby emit Brems, gravitational Bremsstrahlung. And I'm going to encode this radiated momentum by this delta r mu, this radiated, uh, radiated momentum of the system. And that thing, once you project, once you project that uh, momentum, for example, in the center of mass frame, you get the radiated energy. So what does KMOC do? I already mentioned that KMOC has kind of a quantum, is a quantum picture for uh, classical gravitational uh, observables. So in this KMOC framework is like these observables that we want to study are related to quantum operators. And what we are interested in is the change in some observable uh, O, which is encoded by this uh, quantum operator that I denote by this fun, funny O. And we want to know the change in an observable between a state in the asymptotic future and that we call an out state compared to a state in the asymptotic past, which we call an in state. So now how is this related to scattering amplitudes? So the key feature here is that uh, in, the, in, the, in the quantum theory, the out state is related uh, by linearity to an in state via the S matrix. So that's where, and the S matrix we commonly write is like identity pit plus the actual scattering, the scattering part, which is related to the scattering amplitude. So now one can go through the motion and uh, write uh, the out states in terms of the S matrix and the in state, um, reorganize and shuffle some terms to write the change uh, in an observable by certain commutators uh, in terms of the S matrix elements. And uh, just for nota later notation, I, there's, there is a one thing that's linear in the there's one thing that's linear in the scattering operator, and that part I call virtual matrix elements. And then there is a part that is uh, quadratic in the in the scattering in the scattering matrix, and I'll call that real contributions for reasons that should become obvious uh, later. So one uh, one key feature that KMOC did is they did a very careful analysis of these states in terms of like taking their classical limit, and in particular for these uh, massive particles, the in or the in states are written by some superposition uh, of with some momentum space wave functions that are strongly peaked, and these two particles, as I said, they are separated by some impact parameter BMU. And so that is reflected in this, uh, in this translation, in this translation part in this exponential. And then the superposition is in terms of plane wave states. So these are momentum eigenstates. So, and then uh, K 
KMOC, KMOC in their paper show and go to a, like very detailed motion how to take the classical H bar goes to zero limit uh, uh, consistently. So the bottom line is I'm not going to go review uh, this part. Uh, David has talked about this in his talk, and you can, for more details, you can look at, uh, at their, the, the KMOC paper. The bottom line is from this analysis is that the change of this observable uh, just boils down to, the, to some uh, transverse Fourier transform uh, where Q mu is, the, is this what David called momentum mismatch or the momentum transfer. So it's a transverse Fourier transform because there's like these two delta functions that localize uh, the longitudinal directions and you're left with a transverse, a transverse integral times these uh, KMOC kernels. And uh, most of the time I'll focus on these KMOC, KMOC kernels in momentum space. So now, so and I said, I call them virtual and real kernels. And why do I do that is because of the following. So you can write this uh, pictorially. I said that these kernels are related uh, to the scattering matrix and in, the, in the sense that there's like some commutator of this quantum operator with the, with the scattering matrix computed in the, now here in the plane wave states, in and out states. And this virtual piece we, piece we, can, uh, we can write as an, a quantum operator acting on a S matrix element. And the real piece, which is quadratic in the scattering operator, you can insert an identity and then it's pictorially written as this cut part and you're supposed to sum over all possible states that can exchange in the cut. Uh, you have to sum over all, you have to, it, the resolution of the identity includes this uh, on-shell phase space integration for all exchanged uh, states here across the cut. And then this quantum operator acts on one of the amplitudes only. And that encodes the measurement function depending on what observable you're considering. So this is like a kind of a quite generic uh, setup that I've been writing here. So one thing I'd like to comment is like so far I have not said anything about some small g expansion or uh, some some perturbative expansion. So so far also what uh, what uh, um, Donald commented yesterday uh, these uh, formulae are exact. But for us, of course, to do practical calculations, uh, we want to expand these amplitudes and small coupling constants g newton. And one thing that's uh, also important uh, uh, in this expansion in order to do the classical H bar expansion, uh, we can relate this H bar expansion to the momenta in the game where like every massive momentum in this H bar counting scales like order one, the momentum transfer or the momentum mismatch scales like an order H bar and every graviton loop momentum that I'm gonna show later scales, scales also like H bar. So we've already heard several times that in the context of the method of regions and EFT by developed by Benik and Smirnov, the region we are interested in for like that takes both radiation and conservative effects into account is called the soft region. And again, the classical expansion, the H bar expansion is linked to the small Q expansion of these observables. Okay, so this was the classic, so this was the general setup. Uh, of KMOC for some observable, some observable that we're interested in that I just here denoted by delta O. So now I'm going to go into details to really discuss first the gravitational impulse, that is the momentum shift on one of the particles that I particle I uh, during some scattering event from the far infinity to far uh, far future. And for concreteness, I'm focusing on the momentum shift on particle one. So again, in the context of this general KMOC uh, formalism, this momentum P1 is associated to some quantum operator capital P and uh, the, out and in, the out and in states are related by the S matrix. So you can go through the motions uh, and, and write down what this means pictorially. I'm gonna directly focus on these impulse kernels for the momentum shift that I introduced earlier. So, it, so it's still completely uh, uh, to arbitrary orders in G with full amplitudes. The effect of this measurement operator associated to this quantum operator P mu comes from the, like is associated to the fact that there is some, some, some momentum insertion in the numerator of these objects, which measures the difference from the outgoing to the incoming or this momentum mismatch between the uh, outgoing and incoming state here. So this is just Q mu in this, in this virtual impulse kernel. And for the radiative piece, you're measuring the, imp 
the, the shift between this leg and the incoming leg, which is just uh, which is just related to what I call L, so I'm, so I'm loop momentum L1, and you're supposed to sum over all, uh, you're supposed to do the phase space sum over all possible exchange states. So yeah, so again, the, the effect of this measurement function for this momentum on P1 is the insertion of some loop dependent, a priori loop dependent um, um, impulse numerator that I call L mu. Okay, so this was the this was the complete. So this was the non non perturbative uh, representation for this observable. But of course, again, we can uh, we can expand this. Uh, we can expand these observables in in G Newton, and so then at leading order in the impulse, it's just the impulse kernel is just given by Q mu times this empty blob here. For me, is a tree level amplitude, the tree level amplitude of these two two scalar scattering. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. At next to leading order, or at uh, um, order g squared, the impulse kernel is given by uh, q mu times one loop amplitude minus. So here, for the first time, we get this quadratic piece in the scattering in the scattering matrix, uh, which is written in terms of like a, this two-parted cut, where we're inserting where we're inserting uh, this loop-dependent factor. And one thing uh, I want to point out is that these virtual amplitudes here, they have both imaginary parts and both and super classical contributions that cancel against these iteration or these cut pieces to get, of course, at the end of the day, the classical observable is some real observable. So we have to get a real result and we're interested in the classical parts or all the super classical pieces. So has it, or the observables have a well-defined classical limit, so the super classical pieces have to cancel. So at one loop, this is very that's all pretty simple and easy to understand. So things get a little more uh, non-trivial at next to next to leading order or at, at G cube. So this is the G cube contribution, where this impulse kernel is written in terms of the two loop classical amplitude. And I want to note that in order to do this calculation, we had the full two loop amplitude as a crucial building block in uh, in GR in already in this paper. And uh, from this, in the KMOC formalism, we're supposed to subtract off these, iter or these cut, the real pieces, which here at a, a two loop order come in two, in two things. Like one is a tree level amplitude times a one loop amplitude, a two particle cut. And one piece is this uh, three particle cut uh, that, we, uh, that we heard also from uh, Paolo Di Vecchia, uh, uh, yeah, I guess yesterday. So in comparison to one new case, the cancellation of super classical terms and imaginary parts is more trivial. And uh, in order to show that, uh, we can use cutting rules and unitarity to write down simplified formulae for these impulse kernels. And uh, Michael is going to talk a little bit more about cutting rules also that help us for the evaluation of these, of these uh, on-shell phase, on phase space integrals. So in order to simplify, in order to simplify our calculation, uh, it is convenient to decompose the impulse <clears throat> into a transverse part and a longitudinal part, where the transverse part is uh, proportional to this uh, momentum transfer Q mu, and then there's longitudinal parts that are uh, proportional to what we call these U variables, which are nothing but like related to like the, just the particle momenta of the heavy states over their masses. And we choose, choose some convenient orthogonal basis just, uh, just for convenience. So with this uh, decomposition, um, it's, one can show, and we have shown in our paper, that uh, at next to leading order, the transverse impulse uh, is just related to the real part of the one loop amplitude. And basically, the, 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 the goal or the, the only reason for this, uh, this cut piece that we had up here um, the, the role of this cut piece is to cancel the imaginary part, which exactly leaves us with just the real part of the one loop amplitude. And there's a longitudinal piece that one can also write down, which is just related to the imaginary part. So one thing I want to point out is just from the fact that uh, the L loop amplitude always comes with a Q mu. There's never a longitudinal, there's never a longitudinal co uh, contribution from the L loop amplitude, uh, but only the, the only longitudinal 
contributions can come from these cut pieces when we decompose the L mu in terms of transfers and longitudinal pieces. So at next to leading, at next to next to leading order, we can do a similar cutting rule analysis uh, to write the transverse impulse kernel, which is just given by the real part of the two loop amplitude. So the, again, the cut pieces uh, are there to cancel all the imaginary parts. So, we, so we're just left with the real part of the two loop amplitude. But then there's one additional term, kind of like some tree cube subtraction term. And uh, so that thing, the role of this guy is here to cancel all uh, super like the real super classical pieces. So I'm not going to go into a detail. I just want to show you like we can do this integrate. We can do all the integrations. And uh, that's kind of the, that's the result we get uh, for the two loop transverse impulse kernel. And uh, people who've computed the amplitude, uh, the two loop amplitude, they will recognize many of the terms. Uh, and the only uh, the only difference that might be between the full amplitude, the real part of the full amplitude, is some iteration piece that we've subtracted out here. And Michael is going to go more into the details. I just wanted to flesh how these uh, equations look like, where sigma is just the Lorentz factor between these two black holes. So that was the that was the impulse. Um, the second observable we computed actually beforehand was the radiated momentum carried by uh, gravitational waves, because it turns out that that observable is a little simpler, because in that observable you're measuring you're measuring some momentum on the radiation. So you have to have this radiation piece. So there's, so you only have uh, these real contributions or only these cut contributions. So there has to be at least one graviton exchange and the momentum is measured on this graviton. So the leading order effect starts at G cube and uh, um, what uh, Paolo was also telling us about is that, uh, yeah, this is related this is related to this uh, uh, three particle cut where you measure the momentum on this graviton. So, so these are the building blocks. These are the types of things that we have to compute. Uh, and uh, so the crucial, we've already seen that the crucial building blocks are these uh, off shell or virtual amplitudes and these unitarity cuts. So we have to construct, so we can use uh, uh, particle physics tools to construct um, these integrands and loop amplitudes efficiently. And for that, we use generalized unitarity. And uh, also in Radu Royvan's talk last week, he gave many details on how these uh, generalized unitarity cuts and uh, construction works uh, from a practical point of view. So yeah, just to reiterate, uh, we use them for both the virtual amplitudes. And then from these virtual amplitudes, we can take unitarity cuts and cert certain loop momenta in them to get the KMOC uh, uh, observables. And we, uh, we obtained these integrands by generalized unitarity that has been pioneered by Steve Byrne, Lance Dixon, Dave Dunbar, David Kossauer in the 90s. So for this uh, two loop problem for the order G cube in, uh, in GR, it turns out that the relevant diagrams that we have to consider is the set where the first line has already been considered for the conservative dynamics. And in the second line, these are the new contributions that we have to take into account for uh, the radiative dynamics. So these are these like type of mushroom and uh, box bubble uh, topologies that we also heard in earlier this morning. So explicitly, what do we do? Like we write down an ansatz for each of these, uh, each of these graphs in terms of Lorentz dot products between the external momenta and certain loop momenta. And then we use this, we, we uh, equate this ansatz with uh, the generalized unitarity cuts. So these are just products of tree level amplitudes that we can compute by any means necessary, but there's also some nice story between like the double copy between Young Mills and gauge theory to simplify these calculations. So at the end of the day, we equate the generalized unitarity cuts against our ansatz and that allows us to fix these AI, AIJ coefficients. And then we have an integrand. We have the two loop integrand uh, for the classical scattering in GR. And from that, we can cut that integrand, insert the loop momentum to get all the pieces that we need for the KMOC, uh, for the KMOC framework. And uh, so once we have this integrand, it comes, uh, well, the, the bottleneck is uh, how to evaluate these integrals. And at the end of the day, we want to assemble results, do some cross checks, and do analysis to see if we can uh, determine any, any structures. 
So this would uh, conclude my part of the talk. So I think we can have some time for questions now, or we can directly go to Michael and uh, lump all the questions uh, together at the end, depending on uh, 